right, we are recording. So I have Shannon Thomas um, it, from uh, South Lake Christian Counseling. She's a licensed clinical social worker, supervisor, and the owner and lead therapist at South Lake Christian Counseling in South Lake, Texas. She is also an author of an abuse, abuse recovery book and is uh, researching for her next book now. Excuse me. So thank you, Shannon, for taking the time to meet with me today. You bet. I'm loving it. Good. Before we get started with the questions, um, can you share a little bit about your background and how you got started in the field of social work and abuse education and then offered, authored this book, uh, Healing yes. from Hidden Abuse, A Journey Through Stages of Recovery from Psychological Abuse. People love stories, so can you share a bit of yours? Sure. Uh, so in my background, um, I have an undergraduate degree in pre-law, so I planned on going to uh, law school because I really wanted to do advocacy work. And uh, life has a way of twisting and turning, and I got into a master's of social work program instead of getting into the law schools I wanted to get into, which is a very good example of just going where life takes you because I think I would have been really unhappy as an attorney, <laughs> and I love my work as a counselor. And so um, that was sort of my background education-wise. Family-wise, um, I went through quite a bit of trauma at a young age with the passing of my father and then my mom's subsequent um, mental health and drug addiction issues. And so really learning that there's a lot of uh, kids out there, a lot of teens out there, a lot of adults that are recovering from childhood trauma. And I really enjoyed doing social work uh, when I began with family and children's services and working with families in crisis. And then I kind of just stumbled into private practice um, as an internship, I enjoyed it. I worked at a school site and uh, was an elementary uh, school counselor and really enjoyed that uh, internship and then wanted to continue in private practice beyond that. And that's kind of, it's just a, a winding, twisting road and that's where I'm at right now. All right. Um, can you explain hidden and psychological abuse to those who don't know or have yet to read your book? Please share the meaning of the cover of the water drops with me too. I love sure. that. Thank you. It definitely has some um, specific meaning. And as far as going back to, um, you know, healing from hidden abuse, I think when I was thinking about a title, I really wanted to describe that sort of cryptic, um, hidden nature of psychological abuse where, you know, you don't really notice that it's there, but you can feel it for sure. Once you have a better understanding of what some of the dynamics are of psychological abuse, then you can definitely call it out of this is triangulation or this is gaslighting or these are flying monkeys. But without the education piece of it, it's very hard to describe. So when I was thinking about the material that was gonna be in the book and was in the book at the time, I really wanted a title that grabbed the true meaning. And the true meaning was how to heal from those things that you know are there but are hidden from your family, from community, from friends. And um, I went around with a whole bunch of different titles, but that just really seemed to capture exactly what was in there. I, I wasn't dealing with as much the um, overt, physical, domestic violence, broken bones, broken things. I really specialize in more of that cryptic, hidden, um, deconstructing of someone's personhood type of use. And so with the raindrops, the idea was that we wanted to, when we were doing conceptualizing um, different ideas about it, is when you're looking through a window and there's water and there's rain, you can kind of see the outside, but you can't see it clearly. So there was kind of that murkiness. Um, I really wanted to capture that. And then the raindrops are kind of that drip, drip, drip of, of abuse that happens. Um, this is not a one and done type of abuse. This is not just a huge big bang and everybody knows and everybody sees and it's very public. It's the dripping of poison, just drip, drip, drip. And so that's what the raindrops really represent. And a lot of times with this type of abuse, people will try to say, well, one raindrop didn't really bother me, you know, and try to isolate out different um, experiences. And we really can't. It's the entire thunderstorm of the picture. And so, and then with the peeling back on the cover, it's really peeling back that sort of um, murky cryptic nature and revealing that this is abuse. So 
the, the cover, I was really fortunate to work with um, the person who finalized the cover for me and Ty Richards, and he really understood sort of my vision of what I was looking for, so. Good, good. So it's like a covert kind of abuse rather than the overt physical violent kind of abuse. That's what yes. hidden abuse. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, even, even in some jurisdictions, it's really hard for law enforcement to, um, depending on the laws that they have, even go forward with the very covert, you know, ripping doors off the of door jams type things and, and busting walls. And in some jurisdictions, someone can, you know, destroy their whole house and that's up to them to do it, even if there's people in if there's children in the home, which I think is horrendous. I think those laws really need to be changed. But then try to describe the covert, cryptic, psychological abuse that is absolutely deteriorating people's um, livelihoods and their health and other types of things. There's no laws on those types of abuses. And so we're trying to really get education happening so people can understand that there is a type of hidden abuse that's very real. Right. So can you give me a couple examples of like tactics used by psychological, psychological abusers or these dysfunctional families that you've seen or heard about? Sure. There's a, there's a lot. I think that the one I hear a lot about is the gaslighting where people will, abusers will say something wasn't said, but it was, um, plans were made that really weren't uh, followed through on. And what they'll try to do is they'll try to make it out to be that it's the target's memory that's faulting. Um, you know, somebody will take out money of a bank account and spend it, um, the abuser will, and then that abuser will blame the victim or the target for spending the money. Well, they never took the money out to begin with. But if they can, if the abuser can do that over and over and over again, the target will become really to doubt themselves of whether, did I take that out? Did I spend that money? Did I make these plans? Did we say that? And they start to really doubt themselves. Um, within families, a lot of it can be triangulating with siblings, um, especially as, you know, either growing up or as adult children, there will be a favorite child. Um, that child can do no wrong, even if it's an adult child. And there's a lot of comparing where um, the targeted survivor would be uh, told by the toxic parents, you know, well, so-and-so would do it this way, and so-and-so bought me this, and so-and-so is, you know, always coming over and visiting, and, and it's sort of that real underhanded type of making the other adult child or child feel less than, feel that they're not um, meeting the needs of the parent, and it's just that targeted over and over and over again that really ends up making people doubt themselves and doubt whether they're a good person or not. Right. So like when you say triangulation, do you mean like um, telling one, like say in the sibling uh, case with a parent, telling one sibling, one child, their child, one thing, and then telling another child another thing? Like, for example, what I've seen is um, like telling one child, the other child's mad at you about mm -hmm. such and such when they're really not but they right. just are causing drama between the siblings so that they all basically come back to that parent to say, oh, you know, it keeps that connection with that parent, but all the others, all the siblings are fighting amongst themselves. Have you seen a lot of that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very hard to have a close, real authentically close relationship with an adult sibling or even a teen sibling uh, with uh, a toxic parent involved because they will, they will separate, divide and conquer. And that's where they'll start to, like you said, you know, tell lies to one and then deny that they said it. And it always comes back to the scapegoat. Whoever that person is in the family, whatever goes on will end up being that person's responsibility. And toxic families have to have a scapegoat. So it, it isn't necessarily about the person's personality or um, the specific to themselves of why they're the scapegoat. Every toxic system has to have one. So somebody gets picked, right? Right. <laughs> I can, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> I'll just leave it there for another video, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> I hear from women who say they're afraid to call what they're experiencing this, you know, hidden covert abuse or like you talk about the drip drip um, because they're told their actions are actually abusive or they're the problem or they're crazy like you talked about with the uh, gaslighting or right. they also fear being blamed for wrongly accusing their abuser or mm -hmm. another thing i hear is well it wasn't as bad as somebody else 
So it, we can't really call it abuse. So what do you say to somebody like that when they come to your office or experience that? Yeah, I, you know, for me, the idea of what is abuse and what is not, I think there's some very distinct markers that we can say, you know, what is the, the purpose of the behavior? You know, silence, for instance, if we decide to go silent with somebody, but we're doing it because we want to set healthy boundaries, we want to um, have no contact with somebody that's poisonous, or we just don't want to be as close to somebody that we find to be manipulative. The reason for silence is healthy. If someone's using silence to make another person feel unloved, if they're using silence to try to make another person anxious, um, it's the motivation of why the silence. One can be good, one can be good boundaries, the other can be trying to get a reaction out of somebody. So I think when we look at abuse or what is abuse, we have to kind of figure out, okay, why are these behaviors happening by this person? And if it is a unhealthy, kind of diabolical, trying to gain control over another person, then we would call that abuse. And there is a spectrum to behaviors for sure. There's a wide range to um, how much damage gets done. But if somebody is intentionally trying to harm another person and know that they're doing it and not sort of um, impaired by any sort of other true mental health issues or other types of you know, uh, cognitive issues, but they're fully aware of what they're doing, that's abuse. And even though there is a range, it doesn't mean that somebody else's abuse is worse, doesn't mean that someone, another person doesn't exist. It's kind of the idea that just because people are hurt in a particular way, doesn't mean that the other person's hurt isn't real and true and harmful. You know, whatever causes those feelings of insecurity, of anxiety, of uh, feeling controlled, uh, tears, uh, depression, all of those things, those are real. Those are real things, and it doesn't matter the intensity that caused them. Right, right, exactly. So I was watching another video interview that you did recently where you talked about the different uh, personal capacities that each of us have and how, you know, like I just said, we can compare ourselves, our trauma to another person's. Um, do you believe that someone might call normal actions or behavior um, abuse where others would not, where another person wouldn't call it abuse or wouldn't think that it was abuse? Um, you know, I think that it's important for us to get some real um, sort of boundaries around is, is certain behavior abusive or is it not? Um, I think it gets to be a slippery slope when, um, you know, somebody would say, well, that person didn't meet my needs and now they're abusive. I think we do need some sort of guardrails around what the term abuse means. And like I said before, it's the intentionality of the actions. You know, if, if somebody is uh, not meeting another person's needs because they just don't have time, that's not necessarily abuse at all. Um, if, because I think we can get kind of demanding. There's a lot of people can have a sense of entitlement. And what we end up seeing is the abuser saying, I'm the victim, I'm the one that's being abused, when actually they're not. Um, I do believe it has to do with the intentions of the actions. If, um, if somebody isn't, you know, meeting another person's needs, it's the why. Are they trying, but the other person's needs are uh, too much to be met by any one person? Or is it that um, they're not trying, they're neglectful, they're um, trying intentionally to harm? The kind of abuse that I specialize in recovery is the intentional. It's not necessarily the um, I'm struggling with drug addiction necessarily story and I am inadvertently harming those around me because of my addictions. That's not the type of abuse I specialize in. That's a whole other issue. And those folks that um, there's healing that can happen for a large group of people that behave badly, they go and deal with themselves, they get recovery, they deal with underlying mental health issues, um, they get treatment, uh, they make amends, and they move forward in life. The ones I specialize in are those folks that will never go to treatment because nothing's wrong with them. I, I specialize more in that um, abuse where it is intentional, on purpose, systematic, and for their benefit of the abuser. So I do think we do need to have some guardrails around uh, the term abuse because everybody could be kind of throwing it out and then it waters down its real meaning. Right, right. 
that's where it's, I think it's good to have good uh, abuse education. And it's wonderful that we've come so far and even 10 and, you know, 20 years of the education available to us on the internet and in books and that kind of thing um, to really have a definition, a clear definition. And that's why I like your book too. A lot of examples in here about, you know, um, you give scenarios and that kind of thing and tell the differences, um, which leads right. into my, my next question is like, how do we know the difference between the victim target um, turn survivors, what I say, um, mm -hmm. and the abuser? Because you, like you just said, is a lot of times the abuser will play the victim and want to uh, make the target the abuser. Right. And I think that sometimes we can sort through, you know, who's who by who's willing to have open communication, who's willing to um, discuss as, you know, two calm adults, even though it might be a, a passionate conversation of feelings and emotions, who's willing to hear the other person finish their entire sentence without always having to interrupt in the yeah buts, who's willing to apologize for what they truly feel, you know, that they own, um, who's willing to go and to counseling and stay in counseling you know, not just the pop in and let me complain about the other person and pop back out. Um, who's willing to sustain change? That's where we start to sort out and put into sort of different camps. Okay, this person just wants to give the facade of being the victim. This person actually wants to work through whatever relationship issues are, are real and, and there and is willing to continue to come back to working on themselves. Um, abusers don't do that. You know, true abusers that don't want to change will not go through a process of uh, self, I don't know, um, looking at themselves, uh, taking a deep, hard look, having other people speak into their lives. So their actions will really sort through who is the true uh, perpetrator. So would you say that like victims are able to take the criticism where a psychological abuser would couldn't hear that? Well, unfortunately, yeah, well, a big yes to that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, victims and, and targets of psychological abuse have a personality type that they'll be more than happy to take a look at themselves quite a bit, and the abuser banks on that. So these, these types find each other where the abuser wants someone who's going to go, okay, let me look at myself, let me see if there's some truth to this of what's being complained about me. And the abuser's like, great, go have at it because I'm not going to do any of my own self-reflection. Right. You know, the abusive ones. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I talk about a lot about how when I first went to counseling thinking, you know, going and saying I had, I thought I was just crazy and horrible and awful and abusive and the worst person and the counselor just laughed and said, right. you, ha you have a boundary problem. You need, to, you need to learn boundaries, you need to assert boundaries, and you need to get help in that area. And I spent several years in counseling myself, and I, tell, I talk about that on my blog and everything on my videos. But can you tell me really quick, and I know I talk about uh, boundaries a lot in my videos as well, but can you just give me a really quick, um, what are boundaries, what's that look like, especially when we're dealing with this kind of toxic person that's not willing to get help? Sure. Um, you know, I use the visuals a lot, and the one I like the most is the big H. That's that's a boundary. Person is one person, the other one's the other one, and they kind of choose to be around each other. That could be friends, that could be uh, romantic, that could be in a workplace. Um, but each are individual equal people. When we start to not have boundaries, we get into this A. We get into this sort of leaning and dependent, and when one moves, the other one falls kind of thing. So we're always wanting to get where we're on our own kind of, you know, not just where we're not interconnected, but where we can stand in our own space, have our own opinions, share that, not have to project that like you must agree with me, um, but hey, here's me, you're you, and let's just keep it that way so that we can kind of figure out where the middle ground is. Boundaries are really just about that honoring of one another. It's that idea of I don't have to make anyone think the way I think, I don't have to make other people do what I want them to do but I am going to share what my request is. And then it's really up to them to decide whether they're going to fulfill that. And then I have to decide whether I want to be in a relationship with people that behave in a certain way that I like. And I, I'm a big believer in not trying to change other people. We just have to assess, do I like the way they live their lives? Do I like the way that they treat me? If my answer is no, I might tell them once, hey, I really wish this was different. I might tell them twice, 
beyond that, it's just turning into nagging because they just want to be the way they want to be. Well, go, God bless them. They can go be that way, but just not with me. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> You know, so I think that's kind of the boundary is you be you, I'll be me, and we have to figure out that's compatible. Yes, very good. Thank you. Very good analogy. So, you know, like I said, it, um, I had a hard time at first. I struggled, and I tell my clients to practice, practice, practice. The more chances that you can find to practice, uh, the better you'll get at boundaries. Um, so do we, can we rewire our brains to keep boundaries with these, these types of people, um, especially after abuse and divorce? Yeah, I think what, especially with divorce, folks are forced to have to interact with them. And I think the best way to keep boundaries is to never forget what things were like in the past. And that's not staying bitter, that's staying aware. Because with psychological abuse, it's super easy to forget the details. So we write down the big details, we ground ourselves in what the truth is, every time before we interact with them so that if it's the, a good day and that person's being pleasant great i'm not sucked into that sort of vortex of oh they've changed and now they're all different um because we would know that over time and over sustained change if someone happened to go through some you know powerful metamorphosis or whatever which we've never seen with certain personality types but we always stay hopeful maybe it'll happen right um but we stay very aware of who they are and we enter in, and it's kind of a get in and a get out if we're having to interact with a co-parenting. And it's that detached contact that I talk about in the book. It's, I'm going to be here in this space, but I'm not going to be emotionally um, trapped in this space. Right. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. Because that's kind of what I say to the ladies that I coach, but it's sure. you eloquently perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we hear a lot uh, being said about survivors of abuse being codependent, which, which causes or contributes to the abuse relationship. Um, I don't hear you saying this, this much. I'm not sure where you stand on it. But as I read through the book again, and I um, reviewed the book, and it's on my website um, if you want to check that out and there's links there to the book, but I found again on pages 101 through 109 where you talk about the idols, idealization or ide, idealize, devalue, and discard phases of emotional or abusive, the abusive, ugh, excuse me, yeah. the abusive relationship. Can you explain a little more about this, and is this like the abuse cycle? Sure, and as far as the codependency, um, there's a huge difference between being um, conned into a relationship with a psychological abuser out of uh, lies, deception, just a complete fabrication of what is what, um, and being empathetic and wanting to you know, wait and, and hope that things get better, um, and being codependent. Those are very distinctly different. Codependency, in a real quick nutshell for me, involves a lot of wanting to um, control the other person out of fear. It, codependency is not about dominating, controlling, anger. It's really about, I'm afraid that my needs won't get met. I'm afraid this person's gonna leave. I'm afraid this person's going to um, self-destruct with some of their own you know, uh, behaviors that are dangerous. And I'm gonna work harder than they're working to make sure that they're safe. That, that to me sort of encapsulizes codependency. That is not always what happens in psychologically abusive relationships. Can it? Yeah, it can, but it isn't always there at all. Um, and then as far as, and remind me of the second part of your question. There was- Oh, sorry, we talked about the idealized, devalue and discard, the mm -hmm. IDD phases of uh, abusive relationship. Idealize is that part where the abuser, whether it's in a spiritual environment or a work environment, will um, mirror the target. They will, and just enough, that's a real key, they'll mirror the target just enough not to be creepy. <laughs> Sometimes they're creepy, but a lot of these folks will mirror just enough to, um, we're so much alike, we have so many um, hobbies that are the same, we have so many belief systems that are the same. Um, in a romantic relationship, it might end up becoming the you know, soulmate conversations, but a lot of folks that are psychological abusers, especially the ones that are more tactical and more purposeful in it, will um, mirror back just enough to get the person hooked, but not so much that it's like, whoa, this is over the top and, 
and, and too quick and too fast. They know exactly which each target, how quick to go. That's how calculated we know it is. So when, when a person is meeting a psychological abuser, they're gonna be everything that they've wanted them to be because they're mirroring themselves back in a way. It's like the psychological abuser is mirroring the target back. So sure, it, there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna be appealing, so it's a quick appeal. The devaluing stage is where everything changes. So everything that was so fabulous about the target that the, sort of, that the abuser was saying in the beginning now becomes all the things that drive them crazy. Now becomes all the complaints. Now comes the tearing down of the survivor's um, self-esteem, uh, personhood, um, a lot of the jealousy type games start to get played in this devaluing stage. And this is where some people will get hooked in a codependent relationship. Not all survivors, but some will. Some will work really, really hard to their own detriment to get that idealization feeling back. Some do not. Um, so it's really just a personality um, kind of difference. And then the discarding can happen even if the abuser never actually leaves the relationship, but is now just completely checked out. Doesn't reply very much, um, probably has moved on to other targets potentially, uh, back looping into the idealization stage with somebody new. It's just, or it's a discard where the person just kind of um, leaves the relationship. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, but there is a codependency happening. It's often during that devaluing stage. So is the abuser then kind of creating a dependent relationship or trying to? That's kind of his, his or her goal Absolutely. Um, to continue the abuse? Yes. The idealization is all about creating a dependency. Gotcha. It's about the trauma bonding. It's about the um, love hormones or the uh, good hormones. If it's not a love relationship, it's those ideas of attachment. If it's in a spiritual environment, it's, you know, connecting on that level. Um, yes, so the idealization is all about creating the dependency. Now, whether it bleeds into codependency officially just depends on the personality of the survivor. But yes, right. that's always the goal. So the, like the, the target survivor could maybe not have any other codependent relationship with anybody, but has got sucked into this relationship with uh, this abuser. And then now his has a codependent relationship and maybe after years of marriage one of the things I I get emails from women who've been married you know 20 30 40 right. years and maybe they have healthy relationships with everybody else but they're in this codependent you know so-called uh, relationship with their abuser and and they don't know how to get out would you, would you agree with that Yes, absolutely. And I think there's um, a very good book, When Pleasing You is Killing Me by Dr. Les Carter. And um, it's coming out in reprint. I think it's not available right now, but it will be soon. And um, it is an excellent book to sort through some of that people pleasing, because that's what happens when the idealization stage leaves. Well, people start panicking into, I want to get those feelings back. I want to be uh, in the relationship that I was offered in the idealization stage, but now the game has changed to the devaluing. And so, yes, a lot of work gets done um, in the people pleasing and trying to please the abuser, trying to address all of the complaints the abuser has suddenly. The survivor will go, okay, the, this person that I love or this person I was really close to at work or this mentor or wherever the case or my parent um, has all these complaints and I'm gonna work really hard to address those. Well, the problem is though, a true psychological abuser doesn't wanna get along. They thrive on the chaos. This is their whole approach. This is what they want. So as hard as a survivor is working to try to make the relationship better, the abuser is working just as hard to come up with new complaints. It's the right. never-ending you know, treadmill. Exactly, exactly. So I, in my blog, and um, I talk a lot about hope, and I want to give hope to women after experiencing this kind of abuse. Um, from your experience, especially as a counselor, um, can women go on to experience healthy relationships free from abuse after experiencing this type of abuse? Yes, absolutely. I see it all the time as a therapist, which is one of the main reasons I decided I wanted to write the book, because there's some great material out there already before um, the book I wrote, but I didn't see really, um, so from a therapeutic approach, what were the stages to getting out and getting through and getting better? And I saw it over and over and over. And every client I've worked with over the years, men or women, 
um, have walked through those six stages. And, and that's why I ended up stepping back and saying, okay, what is the process? So yes, there is a lot of hope that people can recover. People can learn what are red flags? How do I enter into a relationship in a different way that would really turn off a narcissist, which is to go slow, to uh, give out personal information very um, on an as needed basis. And, and it's not a paranoia at all. It's being in a relationship is a gift. And we want to give that out very, very slowly after a psychologically abusive relationship or marriage. And but many people are able to to uh, move on eventually. It takes a long time, but able to meet somebody else and set those boundaries that they may have not set before when they've met someone that wasn't quite a good fit, rather than trying to make people, you know, be something that they're not. It's just this person, this new person dating might not be the right person. So I'm gonna go ahead and end it, end it gracefully, end it with compassion, but not continue down a road that doesn't really work. But right. so, and so with that ability to set those limits, people are able to sift through different dating partners and different dating options and find somebody that they're very compatible with. So that would be good to, with learning boundaries and how to be assertive and um, how to have conflict with people and, and resolve that conflict and move on to a healthy resolution or separate if it's exactly. just a dating relationship. Exactly. And I think that it really starts with um, learning about yourself, what you like you know, and what do you not like? And what's, what are non-negotiables? And they can be silly non-negotiables, but we have the power to make those. <laughs> you know, we have the power to say, I don't want to be with anyone who's a morning person. I happen to be a very much of a morning person that's up at five or 5.30 or whatever. But, you know, we get to say, I want to be with someone that's X, Y, and Z. But I don't have to be apologetic about that. Those are, those are just me. That's just the way I am. And I think survivors need to, and they're able to get to that place after being with an abuser to say, this is the type of human being that I want to partner with again. And I'm not going to negotiate on this. Right. So it's about having standards and sticking to those standards. You bet. You bet. Instead of trying to kind of have a form and then shove people into that form if they don't really fit. Right. And I like what you said in your book as well. I'll put it up here again. Um, that we are the gatekeepers to our lives. I love that. I use that a lot myself and, and tell my uh, clients that as well, that you get to decide what you let in and, and who stays out. Absolutely. And we can do it gracefully. We can do it kindly. We can do it with honoring the other person. I'm a very big believer in what we sow is what we get back. Um, so we can just say no and, and just kind of let that be gentle, but it's still a no. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I uh, get a lot of readers that are moms or parents, and they want to stop the cycle of dysfunction and abuse, um, especially if they see signs of, you know, abusive talk or behaviors uh, in their ch or dialogue in their children. Um, right. How can we turn that around? Is there hope for change in that department? There really is, and I'm in the process of working on a book on financial abuse right now. I just finished up the research, but coming down the pike, I'm going to be working with one of my staff members who's a millennial and fabulous, and we're going to be taking the Healing from Hidden Abuse book that I wrote and writing it for teens and writing it for, real, you know, kind of that like 11 to 8 year old age, um, because they really do need to learn all these terms, but in a way that works for them. So in the meantime, a lot of parents, what they're doing, and rather than saying, because it gets very tricky with um, co-parenting with a toxic person, parents have to be very careful about the conversations that they have because it can be interpreted as uh, detrimental. So what I encourage parents to do is talk about gaslighting. And what would gaslighting look if a peer did it? What, would, uh, what are flying monkeys in your school? You know, um, what are some of the terms that we as adults are figuring out when it comes to psychological abusers? What's a covert abuser? But put it in the terms of their peers. Put it in if they're old enough. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not old enough, then try to cite, kind of um, imagine what it would be like if a peer did this or if a friend did this. But as they get into that 11, 12-year-old stages and older, unfortunately, manipulations happen. Not all these kids are, you know, psychological abusers that are running around middle school. Um, but it, it's a pretty tough environment for a lot of kids. And so we can take some of that and train youth that may have a toxic parent, a psychologically abusive parent, 
without actually calling out the dysfunction of that other parent, but give the, the youth tools to be able to recognize it, um, empower them to set whatever boundaries they can set. You know, a lot of kids can't set boundaries if it's a toxic parent, but what can they do? And I think sorting through each family um, situation is, is unique to each um, you know, dynamic that happens, but really helping those kids understand the terminology in a way that's age appropriate. Right. Exactly. I, I yeah. use the example of like watch a TV show. Most TV shows yeah. have some yeah. some dysfunction in them, and it's really easy to bring up. Like, hey, what do you what do you think about that? <laughs> Great idea. I love music. I love TV. I love using the arts with kids. It's a great idea. Yes. You know, Shannon, this has been really great. I so really appreciate this. And it's some great education on psycholo psychological abuse and help for healing. And definitely your book is great for um, those who are experiencing what, you know, what you, we talked about. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with women who are leaving who are, or have already left an abusive or destructive marriage? Uh, how sure. can they heal and um, obviously go to your book to learn the stages, but also how can they take care of themselves and learn to be emotionally healthy? Sorry, that seems like a lot, but <laughs> just any advice you have. <laughs> 30 seconds, go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all the problems of the world. Yeah. <laughs> when I joke around with my clients, I'm like, okay, we have 45 minutes. We're going to solve every problem in the whole world. So it's all right. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, um, well, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And thank you so much for um, you know, the really beautiful uh, blog post that you wrote um, covering the book. And I appreciate it and just the work that you're doing with the clients that you're uh, seeing. And, you know, it, I think the thing, the biggest piece for folks to remember is that it is messy coming out of psychological abuse. And just because people aren't like one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, staging out that they're looping back to despair, they're looping back to other stages I talk about in the book, doesn't mean that healing's not happening. It is happening. It's just two steps forward, maybe three back, another one forward, maybe two forward and one back. It's just, it's kind of a mess. And I think that just has to be okay. And so that folks can realize that, you know, I'm not completely falling apart. I'm just going back to another stage that I need to give myself grace for. But we talk about it all the time in session. It just is what it is. You know, things are just what they are some days. And if some days are hard, well, we might get less done. If some days are great, then we're doing a whole lot more. And I think just letting the ebb and flow happen of recovery, but knowing what recovery should look like so that we can see when we've reached those goals, we've reached those sort of milestones. Um, but just realizing that it does take time. It's not like breaking up um, or ending um, a relationship in a spiritual environment or um, putting distance with your family. Those are huge steps. Those are huge things to be considering. And I think just being a lot more graceful with ourselves is a, is a, huge key that we talk a lot about with our clients. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talk about it in the, the place that um, we don't often see our children grow at like each inch or centimeter that they grow. And all of a sudden you look and they're six feet tall. It's <laughs> that kind of growth. <laughs> yeah. Or they passed you up and all of a sudden you're like, wow, you're taller than me. Okay. <laughs> yes. I have one of those. I have I one have of those. One yes. Too. And I don't know what, ha how we got there. So I don't either. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's how I felt like my um, healing has been as well. It's, right. it's when I look way back, I can see how far I've come. Yes, yes. And sometimes we just need to do that. We just need to stop and go, oh, this, I would have handled this very differently a year ago. Yes. And, and, it, and it's not prideful. It's not prideful to stop and go, wow, I am, I'm, I'm getting better. Yeah. If we don't notice it. Then who's going to notice it? You know, we should be right. able to stop and say, I'm, I'm feeling stronger. Not, it's, not where I want to be, but I'm feeling stronger. Yeah, that's good advice to kind of uh, pat yourself on the back. Not like you said, not in a prideful way, but in a, hey, look at me. I didn't think I would survive this and look at, I'm surviving and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I'll share some links in the show notes and um, obviously to my website where I have your book in the book review. Mm -hmm. um, is there... Uh, any other information you want to go over quickly and where people can find you? I think the fastest and quickest way to find me is probably shannonthomas.com. Uh, from there, they can find the business. From there, they can find some of the social media. Um, I think that's probably the one stop. Yeah. And, and also some other articles because I have a press page. 
So there's some other articles that are on there also that would be easy for folks to click to and, and there's some good information from other writers and different things, so. Great. I, like I said, I can't say enough. I appreciate your time and what you're doing for women and how your book is helping so many women. I do refer a lot of women to your book on a monthly basis and I can't wait to read your next book. I actually uh, participated in the survey for that. Awesome. So yeah, shared my, some of my experiences with financial abuse and that's definitely another topic that needs to be uh, had some light shut on it. So, and then again, the, the other book, can't wait for that as well. So <laughs> I got to get some sleep here soon, but yeah, it'll come, it'll come. <laughs> yeah, take it easy in, and, in uh, stages for sure. Yeah, the cycle out with the financial abuse. Yeah, I'm glad you participated. Thank you for doing that. We had over 455 responses and a Good. lot stories on uh, financial abuse and it, if we think psychological abuse is hidden and uh, you know embarrassing for people to talk about financial abuse has a whole other layer to it good good well like I said I appreciate it so thank you